It's gone largely unnoticed that the dingo, Australia's wild dog, is now an endangered species. Given the bad publicity surrounding the animal in recent years, that's not surprising. But after decades of interbreeding with feral domestic dogs, the only pure stock of dingoes on the eastern seaboard is on isolated Fraser Island. There are now calls for the dingo to be protected, but try running that past a sheep farmer. Our report is by Anthony Hoy of The Bulletin. He's Australia's top order predator, and without a top order predator, this country is bankrupt as far as the ecology goes. He's put in hundreds and hundreds of years just surviving, and his instincts to survive are far greater than, than man's way to, to destroy him. The dingo has a unique position amongst iconic Australian animals, not with the profile of the national emblem species of kangaroo or emu, certainly not warm and cuddly like the koala. It sits on the fringe, just beyond the glow of the campfire, not as terrifying as the croc, but often regarded with suspicion, a cunning survivor living off the scraps of the land. Its history in this country is, is, is enormous. Who doesn't know about the dingo? Good stories, bad stories, and even those that kill the dingo for a living uh, don't begrudge the animal's persistence, strength, power, genius at, at surviving. And I think that's sort of an attitude, uh, uh, you know, Australians like and love. But like a lot of ecology in this country, the dingo's very existence is under threat. Seen as a pest in rural Australia for generations, a natural foe of the sheep farmer, the ancient dog is clinging to life, just. It's um, been shown to, to have come here about 4,000 years ago, but was first thought to have been domesticated by uh, peoples in Indonesia and further north in Asia uh, from the uh, pale wolf, the Indian wolf. And, and therefore the resulting animal that you see now today, the pure bed dingoes in Australia, are in that sense quite unique, uh, quite Australian, and therefore, in our view, absolutely worth the effort to, to maintain the breed. And it wasn't until I started doing work with some of the CRO, CSIRO chaps that we discovered that uh, the dingo in the eastern states, particularly Victoria and this part of New South Wales, are now extinct in the wild. So, Come on, that's the fella. Barry Oakman breeds dingoes in these compounds outside Canberra. He describes the differences between these animals and the domestic sure. dog. Dingoes only have one breeding season a year. Uh, their teeth are more narrow than the teeth of a domestic dog. Um, they have a scent gland, like all wild canids have, on their tail, which people don't know about. And the other issue is the fact that uh, dingoes, uh, in their pure type, at the pure strain, can't bark. They have a bark howl, it's a warning signal, but it's a bark with a high-pitched squeal at the end of it. Oakman has dedicated his life to saving the dingo. I got my first dingo when I was six. I'm 65 next month, so that's what, 59 years. Long time. <laughs> Roger Roach, on the other hand, has dedicated his life to wiping them out. So this is the so-called dog tree display of your handiwork. Can you tell us what it's all about, what it means? Yeah, well, <clears throat> it's probably been done forever and a day. Once upon a time, it was uh, they see a dog on sheep or in the bush and the trapper would trap it and he'd hang it in the tree and just to, uh, the farmers had come past or wherever there would say, yeah, that's the dog I saw and no, that's not the dog I saw. And According to Roach, nowadays, this trophy tree yeah, isn't yeah. about bragging. Um, it's just a way to let the farmers know that he's doing his job. You get the people, uh, you know, that probably don't understand the bush as much and, and uh, uh, thinking, oh, the, the, the poor dog, you know what I mean, he's hanging in the tree. And, and then you get the other people thinking, the farmer thinking, oh, he might have got a bit of a tune-up, his, his sheep got a tune-up, and he's thinking, oh, well, the only best dog's a dead dog, you know. But um, it, it's, it's, it is, it's, it's reality, really. That's what it is, it's reality. The job Roger Roach performs is almost as iconic as his prey. He's a dogger. Roach spends his time with his trained dogs, winding his way along isolated fire trails, trying to contain the dingoes in the mountains, 
on the fringes of the pastoral holdings. And a lot of this country is inaccessible. Basically, this mountains that we've got set up for him here and, and any mountain country, it's set up for the dingo and he'll always be here. Roach, the trapper, relies heavily on his dogs. <laughs> so I just use my trap dogs then to, to go ahead and, and smell out <clears throat> where a dog, dingo dog's been, whether it's been one, two, and by me being able to read my dogs, they just tell me really what is going on in the bush. And in this country, like, <clears throat> you, well, I'd be buggered without them, really. Once the dogger has a signal from his dogs that there's activity in an area, he picks a spot and lays a trap. Compared to the traps of old, these ones that we're using now, the modern soft jaw trap, they're unbelievable at uh, um, putting them into the ground like that. And, and when it goes off, they're just like two bits of rubber, just, they're just holding the dog by his foot. And uh, um, they probably, they, they can't get them any more humane than what they are now. And uh, um, anything, like if you wanted to let a dog go, yeah, you just let it go and he'll just run off. No, there's no blood or anything involved in it at all. They are good traps. Roach also has the poison 1080 in his bag of tricks, but he uses it sparingly, favouring cocktails of exotic juices to lure the dogs to the traps. Boy, the old bloke, he called it linger and die. We still call it linger and die. It's just made up of, of uh, different stuff, the concoctions that we come up with, and. Uh, to or maybe hormone based sometimes, but not always, could be food based, but you make them up and uh, um, you just put that there and that's what we call the lure or the decoy to, uh, to bend that dog over. And when he goes over to smell that, you, you grab him by 90, 90 of 100, you'll get him by the front foot. Go back, go back. Sheep farmer John Rounding has seen what wild go dogs back. can do go to back. his stock. He actively hunts dogs in his area, close to the Kosciuszko National Park. It's not so much the sheep that they kill, it's the, it's the remaining sheep in the mob that get so stressed. And uh, yeah, they just, they'll, you'll end up with a break in the wool due to them being uh, stressed. And um, yeah, it's, it's probably the sheep that get killed by the dogs are the lucky ones. It's the sheep that still survive that will suffer for a long time after. Even if a sheep is bitten, that bite will uh, break out every year and, if, and it'll become infected and, and if it if um, eventually either tetanus will get it or the flies. Yeah, they'll never, they never get over a dog uh, bite. Between them, Rounding and Roach have taken the number of sheep kills in their area down from over 100 a year to zero. But the only way to counter the menace is to be constantly vigilant. Yet we'll always have a dog problem. And if, um, if you get one dog into an area or leave a dog in an area, that dog will draw more dogs in. And um, yeah, you'll, if you turn your back on it, it'll come back to bite you. In reality, the dogs that Roger Roach and John Rounding are trapping are hybrid wild dogs, still called dingoes, but in fact, a mixture of breeds. The dogs are getting bigger. Uh, there are wild feral dogs, once upon a time domesticated, uh, running in Kosciuszko Park that are up to 70 kilos in weight. Uh, the smaller ones started about 35. I've had dingoes, as I said, for, what, 59 years, and the biggest dingo I've ever had was only 19 kilos. This intermingling of breeds has now become the ultimate danger for the pure dingo. These days, it's thought that perhaps uh, only 20% of dogs left are pure dingoes or near pure, pure dingoes, so therefore the damage done primarily in farm, sheep farms in this country is by feral wild dogs that are in fact uh, uh, hybrids of the original dingo. So the dingo per se shouldn't be the species uh, blame for, for uh, stock losses. But over the years the dingo has been blamed for several high profile attacks on humans, not the least Azaria Chamberlain. In the Chamberlain case, did the dingo take the baby? Yes. Of course it did. I've no doubt about that. And uh, the same with the, the kitty on Fraser Island, the boy Cage, uh, same thing. They were in the dingoes territory and they were mixing with people from the age of three weeks. Those animals, when they're born close to uh, human habitation, they'll grow up with the people and uh, they believe they're part of the ecology. So accordingly, they're fair game as far as they're concerned. 
Although Barry Oakman has dealt with the animals all his life, he still regards them as dangerous. We don't advocate dingoes as pets. The scars along that arm there, my legs are the same. I get bitten every year. That's last year's bite. Down there, I've had the ten and twine out of that thumb. Yeah, they bite. Michael Kennedy, director of Humane Society International, says if we want to save this animal, it must be protected, and it must happen soon. Unless we have a law, and in this case a federal law, that recognises the dingo's declining status and the need to recover it in some fashion, unless there's an obligation to do so, nothing will happen. So we are therefore looking at finding a way to have the federal government's new biodiversity laws, which are very powerful, they have sway in the states for all listed species, to have that federal law uh, be the saviour, eventually, of the dingo. But merely proclaiming a law won't guarantee saving the dingo. And the question remains, will this ancient ancestor of the Indian wolf have a place in Australia's future? I believe so, but it will be in land sanctuaries. It will be in areas of large acreage with electric fences around it. And uh, it will come, and I think most of the wildlife in Australia is going to end up in that type of situation. And there's places in, in the, uh, the south end of uh, New South Wales, into the Northern Territory, where there are sanctuaries that in the long term dingoes will be released into, I believe. That report by Anthony Hoy and the producer was Paul Steindl. Coming up soon, some music from Irish singer Luca